All right. And before we got started, I figured I'd tell you a bit about something that you don't know about either. Uh, who knows what that's showing us on the map right now? Australia. That is true. It's Australia. Who can tell me uh, what this place is? Asia. Yeah. It is Asia. Yes. That is India, Eric. Um, and is there Italy? I think that's Saudi Arabia. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> right. So I'm from this place here. It's called Chandigarh. And I moved to Australia about seven years ago to do my post right here at ANU. I studied computer science. Does anyone know that? Cool. There you go. Uh, we all learned something new. How long do you think it took for me to fly from where I'm at to Canberra? Yes, Jack. Ooh, close. Yes. Ooh, cl cl Jack was a bit closer. Yes. Uh, a bit more than that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a bit more than that. Yep. Ooh, close. It took me almost one day and six hours to fly from Chandigarh to Canberra. And I came here and I found myself in a hole, quite literally, but it's a really nice hole. I love Canberra. Uh, since I've come here, I have met amazing people like Tim, whom I went to college with and uh, ate lots of brothers and toast in Bergman College. Uh, I also met my friend Brody, whom I ran 106 kilometers within around Charles Pass in that picture. We were very excited and not prepared enough. There was a thunderstorm that night that I didn't know about. Just so you know, if you're planning to run 160 kilometers, look up the weather the night before. Um, I've made some questionable life choices with James over there. But luckily for us, that night we didn't make the questionable life choice and went home instead. Uh, we've, I also started taking flying lessons early this year with my friends Anna and Alex. And earlier this year with some of my students that I teach at ANU, I've started building something called WOMSAT. It's a WOMBAT satellite tracking system that we're building. And that little thing over there, her name's Ursula, an actual wombat that we'll be able to track using these satellites. Um, some of you will remember, ah, there you go. Um, some of you might remember the satellite selfie last year that happened. I was part of the people who helped make that happen. And that's my friend, Alec. Alec is working in CSIRO out in Perth. And he and I took helicopter lessons over Christmas last year. Um, I finished my degree, that's my friend Mark. Mark's holding my degree because he hadn't finished his degree yet and he wanted to see what it feels like to hold an actual one. And he was very stoked. Um, and I rediscovered my love for learning and reading lots and lots of books when I came to Canberra because there's so many awesome places to sit around the lake here and enjoy a good book. Um, but enough about that. We're here to learn today about how we will power the planet in the future. We can't do that before talking a bit about where things started and who knows what the industrial revolution is. That's correct. Lots of things like steam engines and coal started happening. And what also started happening around the industrial revolution was two things. They were, so I'm going to talk a little bit about atmospheric oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide we started adding into the atmosphere around that. So who can tell me what sort of seems like started happening around 1870 over there? Great point. And that's what we'll learn a little bit more about today is how around the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide started going into the atmosphere. And Good question. Uh, give me three minutes and then we'll learn a bit more about that. How's that? I'll make you a deal? Yeah. All right. Cool. So like I say, carbon dioxide started going up both naturally as well as what we were adding into the atmosphere. Um, and Funnily enough, not funnily enough, but terribly enough, in the last 50 years or so, we've been doing an even good job, better job of adding more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is terrible for the environment. So in the last 50 years, we've added, my clicker's not working, it's working now, uh, more carbon dioxide than we did in 130 years of since the Industrial Revolution. And what many things that are happening as a result of that, 
uh, who can tell me what are some of the things we're seeing around us? Yes. Climate change is happening. Yes. The earth is being polluted. Um, and who can tell me? Yeah. Uh, bushfires definitely are more frequent and more devastating than they have been in previous history. And there is research to say climate change might have something to do with it. I'm not an expert, so I might stay away from that one. Uh, and there are many ways in which we can power our planet. And global warming has started to manifest itself in really manifest ways. Uh, people out in many different places have done some modeling that shows us that the current policies that we have uh, will lead to planet warming up to between 2.7 to 3.1 degrees over the next 100 years, which will lead to many things such as biodiversity collapses and uh, the many places being moved and becoming inhospitable for both plants, fauna, as well as us. In the cases where we were to do stuff that would require us to, for example, move from fossil fuels, um, realistically, we're still looking at about a two degree Celsius increase in uh, the planet around us. The earth, we all know, is a very delicate ecosystem. And anything we do that changes that delicateness ever so slightly still has a terrible impact for all the world around us. And Things like uh, we just talked about bushfires are becoming more frequent and more devastating uh, amongst other things because of the planet warming up. And the thing that I wanted to talk about a bit more is we've, there is no planet B. Right? All we've got is this beautiful green, green, blue, pale blue dot. And today we learned a little bit about what people like myself are doing to help keep this place um, as blue as possible. And before we get into that, I know you guys have lots of thoughts around this. Who knows what that is? Yes. That is a windmill. Uh, who knows what? My clicker is bragging. <laughs> um, who knows what this is? That is true. What happens when a solar eclipse is happening, Eric? The moon's in the way and there's less solar energy to go around and using solar panels is a challenge, but solar panels are great because you can capture lots of sun's energy every single day. 10, I think terajoules of energy, 10,000 terajoules of energy falls on. Terajoule is a amount of energy that uh, could power the entire planet if we were, we were to be able to capture it. I should have done the math on what, how many houses it can power. I didn't really do that, so I don't want to lie to you. Uh, it is a stupid amount of energy. Uh, yes. You, uh, that's a great uh, thing to know. Maybe I can convince dad to get one later. How's that? <laughs> um, maybe. Um, uh, and we also have ways to power the planet through hydro energy. Uh, this dam here is out in that thing over there, if you can see my pointer, is out in Egypt. And one of the coolest dams that, I've, that we collectively ever built is out in China. This one is called the Three Gorges Dam. It is so huge that the amount of water contained inside of it actually impacted the gravity of Earth. So we have the ability to make these amazing engineering marvels that not only allow us to um, power the planet, but also do cool things like moving the gravity, although it's not great for us. There are pros and cons to doing projects like hydro energy. There is massive displacement of people as well as where they live, because uh, to build the dam, we have to take lots of water and inundate it inside of this wall we bring in, and that does have cultural and social impacts. Yep. That's exactly right. So one of the cons of building things like dams is the displacement of forests and other ecosystems that are then flooded with the water we break uh, in from its natural flow. Hydropower is better for the environment than is coal when done correctly. 
uh, but no project that big can be done without there being considerations around many different things. And social and cultural elements need to be considered when we do do these projects. So great question. And I think the answer, the straighter answer to your question really is, um, it's complicated and nuanced and need to be more mindful around these things. And another form of energy that we can create is geothermal energy. Has anyone heard about that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so what happens inside of Earth? Yes, Eric? Well, it's hot. It's really hot in there. So what would happen if we were to take some water outside of, oh, and put it on the top of really, really hot mantle? Yes, Jack? That's exactly right. Um, so in the US, there is this giant place called the, who can tell me what it's called? Does anyone know about what I'm going to talk about? No? Yes, Ethan? Now, uh, the Yellowstone National Park has lots and lots of geysers, and we can build giant turbines in which steam from these geysers can be used to move them around and create electricity. It's great to build electricity. It is bad if you're a... I wanted to make that joke, but forget about it. Uh, we also have nuclear power. Uh, who knows about nuclear power here? Yes. That's true. Nuclear power is uh, the way we currently create it is very closely associated with nuclear bombs. Uh, and the history of that is, it's effectively it. And uh, funniest thing about, if we don't control it well enough, it can explode. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. So a, a nuclear energy is uh, both great and there are many people working on creating more safer ways to create nuclear energy. One of them is out in the US, uh, com a company called Breakthrough Energy. What they're doing is taking these giant nuclear power plants and coming up with ways of making them really, really small. Small to the point where instead of having to have giant power plants, we can have smaller power plants that we can put into places like right outside and power suburbs one at a time. And we do this effectively by taking lots of hot water that we create from these nuclear reactions and running them to generate either molten salt or turbines to create this energy. We'll, and we'll talk a bit about that in a bit. Um, and I know there's also nuclear fusion, but we won't get into that today. Uh, who knows what a Dyson sphere is? Oh, Eric, please tell us what a Dyson sphere is. That is true. Uh, a Dyson sphere is a mega structure surrounding a star. Absolutely. Like one day, I hope we're able to make what's called a Dyson sphere. For those of who you don't know, what it is, is a conceptual um, way to take lots of big solar panels and put them around the sun to take its energy, concentrate it, uh, and be able to then turn that energy back to our planet in either direct ways to consume it or in giant batteries to run our everyday things. That would be pretty cool, but uh, yes. Yeah. That's true, so there's many, yeah. That would be more practical, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. So there's other ways to build around that as well. And like, and we one day, a couple of million years from now, when we're more advanced than we are today, maybe you guys can help us build Dyson spheres. And that's probably not going to happen for a very long time. So what we might do today is talk a bit more around um, how to do things today. Uh, what we will do today is uh, talk a little bit about why global warming is happening. And there's two key things that are leading to it happening. One is population size getting increasing progressively. And the other is... It, I did steal it from Kurt Kazad. I, I absolutely did steal it from Kurt Kazad. You, you, you and I watched the same thing online. There you yeah. go. <laughs> Um, and the second factor is, 
there you go. Uh, we are all really cool people in this room. And the other thing that we'll talk about today a little bit is what we can do to control and reduce the impacts of global warming. One of them is around reducing energy intensity and making it more efficient. And the other one is around reducing our overall emissions. And I'll talk a bit about what I do, which is work more in that space, not really understanding why things are happening, but what more importantly, what we can do to solve. So, have you? Cool. Uh, so, firstly, population size is increasing and is projected to continue to increase over the next 100 years. It's the UN predicts that around the year 2100, the global population will peak at around 11 billion. And after that point, plateau out. The reason for that is, yes, we have a question out the back. Uh, the more people we have, the more resources we need, the more people we need to feed, the more people emit carbon dioxide. And the increase in population for that reason is directly tied to how, with the impact we're having on the planet around us. I, uh, so, the, uh, and the second thing is economic growth. So uh, what do I mean by that? Who knows what economic growth means for us in everyday life? Nope. All right. Yes, Derek. Ah, cool. <laughs> so in growth is good. Uh, economic growth is why we're able to do more and more things. It's also the reason why we are able to do innovative things like build new technologies. Um, it's also the reason why we're, we're now consuming more than we have before. And whilst the growth of GDPs and GDP is growth domestic product, which is one way in which economists measure the growth of economies, um, whilst it's good for things like creating better healthcare solutions and better ways to watch TV and YouTube, it's also the reason why everyone seems to be using more and more resources. And one of the things that we've observed also is since there's been a massive expansion in the way we've been growing our economies, there's also been a strong correlation to the carbon dioxide we are putting into the environment. Uh, it was the case with the United States. And we're now at a point where all uh, their per capita, which is per person emission of carbon dioxide, is around seven ton per year, which is lower than people in Australia and in China. But that the thing to remember there is, now that they're a developed country, is it lower? In the history of the development, that was significantly higher. So if we were to combine all of that together, it would be about a year high, even though it's, it's this much today. And countries that are still developing, um, like China and India, uh, and uh, are going to follow similar patterns of growth. Now, there is an argument around there, is it good or is it bad? Um, there's the way developing economies think around it. They, it's necessary for them to be able to do some of the things that you and I are able to do in Australia. To, and it, in their eyes, it's a bit unfair that uh, economic growth is also tied so closely to carbon dioxide. So what can we do in countries like where we are at right now? It's a concept called, uh, it's an adult concept called technology transfer, really. The, the point of which is uh, we in countries like Sweden, in Australia and America have good education. We have good resources and we have better abilities to develop new technologies. And morally, it's almost a responsibility to do these things, to help the places in the developing world, to be able to not have to go through the same journey of development as they are currently going on. So that's a bit about why things are happening. We'll talk a bit more about um, two things. The first one is energy intensity. What do I mean by that? Uh, yes, Ethan. Okay. Energy intensity in a nutshell. Yep. Hey, Lottie. That is true. It's exactly about how intense the energy is. Um, and the thing to note around that is uh, energy intensity is a way for us to describe how much energy we can use to create more um, good in the world. So if we were to look at how much energy we can create from things like oil or coal or gas, it takes a lot of it. And uh, if we were to look at how much, how much intensity 
we can use from solar or nuclear, it's about more. So it takes about seven, 12 cents to create enough energy from solar to light 1,000 light, uh, uh, light bulbs. And if you were to use coal, it actually takes 75. So using coal is less efficient uh, from an economic lens than it is to use solar today. The reason for that is we've gotten better and better at creating energy from things like solar. Uh, so there's two things to remember there. The more efficient we get, there's one indirect effects to it, such as if we were to, back in the day, think about how flights used to work. It used to be really expensive to fly, but then it got really, really cheap and everyone started flying. So it used to be rare, but now it's more common. So that's called what we call an indirect rebound effect. You don't have to remember that. And the second thing to remember is the more efficient we get at something, the harder it becomes to become more efficient at it. So it's kind of like when you start exercising, it's really easy to go from completely unfit to a little bit fit. But if you were to then become so fit that you can run in the Olympics, it takes a lot of time to get from that one point to the other. So how efficient we can get also has what we call a limit to its growth. Yes, Satan, you would be very efficient then. It's true. Uh, so the other thing is, that we're going to talk a bit about today is emissions per energy. So what do I mean? In a nutshell, it's about how much carbon dioxide we are putting into the environment. Uh, and if we were to look at uh, the price around how much it costs to create solar, if we were to build giant solar panels, it costs about $37 to create one megawatt unit. Of That's enough to fire one server for one hour in a day. And it takes about $40 to do it through coal, through wind, and it takes about 112 to 150 dollars US to do that uh, using coal. So coal is less economically viable today than it has ever been in the past, um, and this is all in Australia. So next, we've talked a bit about why global warming is being accelerated. We've talked a bit about what we can do to control it. What we'll do now is talk a bit about, in more detail, what do I do? And before we do that, you're gonna love this. I'm going to talk about what I call the global energy trilemma. So there's three key factors that impact what we can do to control uh, what we can do about solving some of these problems. The first one is reducing our carbon footprint and ways around that. The second one is around increasing the reliability of the solutions that we're creating, whether it be wind, whether it be coal, whether it be solar. The electricity grid needs to be reliable so that every time you turn on a switch, we can rest assured that the electricity actually flows. It would be terrible if you turned it on and nothing came through. Uh, and third thing is around controlling costs and continuing to make these things cheaper and cheaper. So who can tell me what this is? Yes. Uh, it is a coal-fired power plant in Queensland. Uh, the way coal-fired power plants work is we dig up lots and lots of coal from Earth, that's dead dinosaurs, uh, to, turn, to burn them up to create heat. And we take this heat to heat up water to run the steam that, that is created when we heat up water through giant turbines. Yes, absolutely. So the more coal we dig up, the more uh, it, we carbon dioxide we put into the environment. Um, why we can't shut down coal-fired power plants today? Um, we'll, and we'll, that's true. So over the last 100 years, we built these ways of creating energy using coal and gas and other things. And all of the grid that we've built up is predicated on these forms of energy generation sources being there. If you were to take them away right away, we create a lot of instability within the grid. And that's partly what we can continue to work on to fix through some of the things that I work on, which is creating these things, but doing that through software instead of building them through physical assets. Um, and the, so, and the, the other thing to know around coal-fired power plants is, on a very, very simple level, they work in the same way as nuclear-fired power plants. 
which is we take these nuclear reactions, you create lots of heat, you take the heat, you turn the water into steam, run the steam through giant turbines, which move giant magnets around them to create electricity. And that's how, not in Australia, but in a, in a lot of places in the world, we end up with electricity coming to our houses. Um, then the other thing to note around some, something you just said from Daniel is why the current grid relies on the stability thing. So imagine if you were to take a giant rock and try and push it over a hill. It would be really hard, wouldn't it? Uh, but if you were to take a giant rock and start pushing it before the hill came through, it would have a lot of momentum behind it, wouldn't it? And it would be a bit easier to move that rock up, up on top of the hill if you had that running start. And it'll also be easier for you to go down the hill through when you have the momentum build up. So this as a concept in the electricity network is a concept called inertia, which is the amount of stability the grid can have. I want you guys to remember this. You, so inertia is good for the grid and the new ways in which we can also add that into the grid is through giant batteries. This thing here is a giant wind farm out in South Australia. And that over there is a massive pack of batteries. So the batteries don't exist just like they do in this clicker, which is barely working or in our phones or in our laptops. Lithium ion batteries are the same things that are in your laptops. And when we stack lots and lots of them up, we can put them next to wind farms and increase the reliability of these renewable energy sources to add some of that inertia back into the grid through these batteries. And instead of relying on, relying on those turbines doing it, we can write really smart software to do that exact same thing. Uh, and this solar farm out in Nevada is a great example of something like that. We take sun's energy falling onto these solar panels and in the middle of there uh, is a giant uh, sodium containment unit, which gets that sun shown upon it. And it creates a similar chemical reaction to create electricity. These guys don't have a battery around them. So what they do is pump energy back into the grid. And the flip side of that is we add in more energy into the grid that the grid can sometimes handle. So solar is great, but it can also be bad. And that's part of what uh, we'll talk a bit about is how to help use solar in a way that is both good for the environment as well as the stability of the grid. So things don't break down. Um, and there's also a pumped hydro. Has anyone heard of pumped hydro before? No. Yep. Uh, do you know how it works? Do you know how pumped hydro works? Oh. Yep. That's pretty much it. So, but the batteries don't have to be batteries just like they are in our uh, devices. A, a battery effectively, what it's doing is storing energy, potential energy, to turn it into some other kind of energy. So what we can do with a pumped hydro unit is contain water inside of a elevated plane where it stores this potential energy. And when we get this water to go from a region of high altitude to a low altitude and move through a turbine, it moves the turbine round and round, just like we looked at in the coal fired power plants and moves magnets around to create this electricity. The way most of these things work is during the day, we take energy from solar panels and use that energy during the day to get that turbine to move water from the bottom of a lake onto the top of the lake. And at night, when the sun isn't shining, we can use that battery, that lake over there, to move the water from a higher altitude to a low altitude and create electricity. So during the day, we use energy that we aren't using from solar panels and store it in a battery. So that's how pumped hydro plants work. Yes, Ethan? Yeah, so uh, the water goes uphill by turning this turbine around in a different direction. And to do that, we use energy from the sun. So during the day, we pump energy that we aren't going to be using because no one's home to store the energy so we can use it at night. So. Uh, the point to remember here is batteries come in various shapes and sizes. And yes, there's absolutely. So what you've talked about is uh, water leaking out and 
when we build things as engineers, what we do is account for losses and control for leakages like that and try and minimize how much of that happens. So when you come to university, when you've grown up, or if you just choose to do whatever you want to, you'll learn ways to do some of these things. That's true. Yep. So it's, uh, we would build two different kinds of tunnels typically in these things. So one of my first jobs was actually building a dam. And there's one tunnel to pump water in. And the other one gets it down through the turbine. And both of them are different kinds of pumps that are actually attached to it. Right. Enough about pump hydro. Uh, yes. One last question. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you guys are really good at picking up engineering diagrams and taking them apart. <laughs> right. So there's two things to remember out of this. During the day, we're able to create electricity. And um, at night, we need electricity to turn uh, from sources we might not have. So remember two things. In the day, we can create it. And at night, we need to use it. And the demand fluctuates a little bit. And this leads to a problem that is related to uh, something we call in the industry, the duck curve. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's got everything to do with petting ducks, it actually does. Um, <laughs> um, what it is, is used to be people who run the electricity grid used to be really good at predicting how much energy we'll be using at what point in the day back, back around 10 years ago when there was less renewable energy. But as, an, as we're beginning to use more and more renewable energy, the amount of demand we need from traditional resources like coal is reducing because during the day, we can use things like solar. And every time that happens, the demand from those coal-fired power plants goes a little bit down. And we've observed over the last 10 years that the demand from coal during the day is getting lower and lower. And that's what leads to the problems around what I described before, which is the inertia in the system. And because there's less demand, the system is less stable. And to kick it back up to the stability, we need to pump more and more different kinds of energies into it. And it creates in the grid a form of unpredictability and that's what I, in my company, help solve. Um, pardon? And we make money doing it. <laughs> uh, so what, 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 what are the issues that it causes? Number one, it creates voltage issues. Number two, sometimes solar panels, and especially giant solar panels, can accidentally turn off if there's a bad engineering done to them. And then there's problems around islanding in the grid, which is happens mainly in Queensland and New South Wales. The grids that were built in New South Wales and Queensland were built in a funny way where they can operate on themselves sometimes. And when that happens, it creates a massive ripple across the national electricity grid. And that's bad for the stability of the grid. And when that does happen, we turn the grid back up. We don't have the ability to give it a running start because it's completely shut down. So there's no inertia left in the system. And we have to artificially create it. And that act of creating artificial restart in the grid is one of the biggest challenges that the electricity grid is facing right now. And one of the, some of the problems that I'm helping solve. Um, so how does that work? Well, instead of building large fire coal-fired power plants, what we do is create these boxes that hook up to uh, your house meters in and in around your houses. So I work in a company called Reposit Power. And we make these boxes over here that look at how much energy is coming through the meter in your house and look at how much energy is being created through your solar panels. And we can use them to connect with each other and act like brains for your house's energy consumption. And they all talk to each other to create a, a software-based virtual power plant. And the best thing about my job, you want to know what it is? I get to work with my best friend, Mark. Uh, and Mark and I, on that day, we were in, uh, on the day this picture was taken, we were at a school in Woden where we hooked up lots of our boxes onto the solar panels and we installed a big battery and got these boxes to act with other schools 
to get these schools to act like a power plant using the solar energy. And so how do we do that? Well, we, take, we do two things. We apply lots of our software smarts to connect these houses and make them uh, more smart. And two, we, once they're all hooked up together, we get, we, we get them to act exactly like coal-fired power plants and provide energy to the grid. And like I said before, how do we do it? We have one smart uh, box. That is the box that you saw before. I looked at it the other night and it kind of looks like a warehouse, doesn't it? You put it in that angle. And the other thing we use are smart meters. So both of these things have uh, lots of AI and machine learning built into them and they help us do what we do. And the way we do it is using a AI engine called the Terminator. I'm joking, it's actually called an optimizer. What it looks at is weather around you. It looks at what the market is doing. It looks at what your house is doing. And it allows this brain to act both for the best interest of your house as a whole, as well as what is best for the grid. Um, and the way you can all see what it does on these apps that we have that you can use on your phone. So at any given point in the day, you can see how much energy is coming from the sun, how much energy is being used on your batteries, and you can't control it individually, but the AI allows us to get these boxes to do what is best for the house and the grid and act like a giant power plant. And the way we do it is we take the box and we attach it to the battery and the inverter that it get, goes along with these batteries to be able to regulate how much energy comes in and out of the house at what point. And when we get all of these boxes to act together in a suburb or in a city, they act like a giant software-based virtual power plant. Um, so in Canberra, we have uh, about, we have a few thousand houses with our boxes. So that's Canberra for you. Uh, and all of these boxes are acting together to create energy that the people who operate the grid in the city are using right now. We have the same in Sydney, where thousands of these boxes are being used in the, with the combination of solar energy and batteries to act like a coal-fired power plant. And every time we do what we do, we put our reliance on coal a little bit less. We have, that's Brisbane for you. Brisbane has lots and lots of solar energy because sun shines a lot. And we've got a very specific solution in Brisbane where you can use that solar in a very smart way to stabilize the grid um, to do those things. Uh, and that is Adelaide for you. So in Adelaide, those two houses look like they're doing their own thing, but the rest of them help us do some of the things that we do here in Canberra, yes. Some of those batteries are turned off, you're absolutely right. So one of the biggest problems we have to maintain uh, distributed energy resources, that's what these things are called, is being able to manage when they break down. So if you have a big, fire, a big power plant, I mean, anything that breaks down is in the one place. And one of the biggest challenges of managing these things is like you say, some of these things here are turned off. And every time it turns off, someone actually has to go to the house to fix these boxes up, figure out the software that's wrong with them and reboot them up. So there is a overhead associated with these things. So what we want to do when we're building these things is make sure they don't break down. Because uh, it's very expensive to go out and fix these boxes one at a time. Uh, and that is Bruni Island, that is in Tassie. And in Bruni Island is completely off the grid. It is not connected to the national grid at all. Most of the people there have a, a small dam through which they create their energy. And these people who are my customers, they've got batteries and solar panels on their houses to create their own, own energy and use their own energy and act like power plant for Bruni Island. And yes. Oh yeah, that one over there. Yeah. You know what the cool thing about Bruni Island was? That's where I took flying lessons with Alec. Uh, right over there. Um, and this is a graph from 
26th of January this year. Who can tell me what happens on 26th of January? Someone who hasn't, yep. It's Australia Day. Uh, on Australia Day, what happens uh, most of the time? People have a holiday. When people have a holiday, people stay at home. When people are at home, what do people do? Watch TV, turn on their aircon, uh, and do hot water pumps and go for a swim. And every time, have fun. Have fun is great for you and terrible for the grid. <laughs> Play video games and all of, <laughs> and that too. So every single time we have a day off, like Australia Day, and we do things at home, we need lots of electricity and gas and different kinds of energy to allow us to do these things. And when that happens, what we do is we increase our demand in the grid. And because the way these things work and how bad we are as a whole at predicting how much energy we'll be using, because the people who do this can't really predict how often you'll be able to use your iPad or if a cloud comes over Canberra on that day for five minutes and some solar doesn't work, it creates a perturbation within the grid, which is hard for us to predict. And when those, uh, when those random things happen, we have to do this thing where we inject a lot of energy into the grid to stabilize it. Typically, the way we do that is we have this thing called coal-fired peaker power plants. So there are coal-fired power plants whose job it is to run 24 seven, not to create energy, but to act like giant sponges to either soak up all the extra energy using those giant turbines, or when there is an under delivery of how much we need in the grid, because we were bad at predicting it, be able to pump that energy back into the grid. Uh, so imagine that there are more than 50 coal-fired power plants in this country existing because their job is to help reduce that risk in the grid. Uh, and on 26th of January, what we did was instead of getting to use a coal-fired power plant to manage all of us turning on our air cons, we uh, turned on our boxes, about 757 of them in Canberra to provide to the grid all that excess energy. And we do this all the time. I'm sure if I looked it up on my computer right now, these thousands of boxes right now, because people are in their home on a winter day, um, are using the energy we make from our boxes through solar panels yesterday night that is stored in the batteries to stabilize this grid. Every single time we do this, we reduce our reliance on coal a little bit. And that's how we, like I personally, help reduce those carbon emissions we spoke about earlier. Um, and one of the things I wanted to talk about was today, there's lots and lots of coal, but there are innovative things like the ones we've talked about that help us reduce these inefficiencies in the grid. And one day, uh, not that far into the distant future, we, like in the next five years, we anticipate there'll be three more million houses in Australia with solar panels. So the way of the future is renewable. And every single time we do these things, we help make these make the grid and our future a little less bad. Oh, oh, no, did we can't. we can't? We can try, and this is a great point. So I wanted to tell you guys the story about this person over here. Um, her name's Samantha Power. Uh, when I was your age, she used to be one of my heroes. She used to run the U.S.'s, uh, she was the ambassador from the U.S. to the U.N. And it was her job way back when to help ensure we were doing everything we could. The, the, the U.S. was doing everything they could to help people in the developing world live a better life. And I used to watch her on the TV growing up and go, oh, that, that is a very cool person. And when I grew up on a be like her. Two years ago, Samantha came to ANU right over there. And she was planning a book she wrote. So I showed up, obviously, to meet Samantha because I had to. And I bought her book. And for three days before meeting her, I was thinking to myself, what do I say to this person whom I've looked up to for so long? Uh, and I could not think about what to say to her. So I show up to get my book signed. 
And even that day, I didn't know what to say to Samantha. I'm waiting in this line for about 40 minutes and my mind is absolutely blank. And um, I finally come up to the moment where I'm standing in front of the line and Samantha's sitting right there and she looks up to me and she goes, hey, how are you? I'm like, pretty good, how are you? She goes, good, what do you do? I'm like, um, yeah. So it's, it's not, um, not my finest moment. And in the lack of my finest moment, I say to Samantha, just so you know, for the last three days, I've been trying to think what to say to you. Because when I was 12, I used to watch you on the TV and you were one of my heroes. And I can't believe the fact that I'm actually meeting you right now. And Samantha, deadpan, looks at me and goes, oh, that's cute. You must have been a nerdy kid. Don't you wish it was Taylor Swift instead? Um, <laughs> so shamelessly, um, we started talking and Samantha asked, uh, she asked me if I wanted to stick around after the book signing, I could. And we ended up uh, staying around for a bit, had a very long chat. And Samantha said something to me, we just stuck around a lot and I wanted to share it with you guys. Uh, she described what motivated her when she was doing all the cool things she was doing was there's three ways to look at the world. One of them is to identify problems one of them is to appreciate problems. And then there's a third way, which is doing something to fix them. And Samantha says to me, it's good enough to identify problems. It's good enough to appreciate them. But if you want to do something, don't identify and appreciate them. Do something to fix them. So the last thing I wanted to say to you all before we wrap up for today is we in this room are living in the first generations to experience the impact of global warming. And we are the, probably in the last generations to do something to fix them. So between you and I, I reckon we can do this.